Welcome to the adductor tendinopathy lecture. Let's take a look at the anatomy that surrounds the adductor tendinopathy pathology. Central to the pathology is the pubic symphysis joint and pubic apophysis. The pubic apophysis is late to reach skeletal maturation and this occurs at around the age of 21. Hyaline cartilage is found on the ends of the pubic bones and fibrocartilage is found in the middle of the joint. The outer part of the joint is an attachment point for the rectus abdominis and below for the adductor longus which has continuity with the rectus abdominis. So for now it's the only adductor we'll worry about at this stage because this is the adductor that becomes tendinopathic. The adductor longus originates from the pubis and then inserts onto the medial third of the thigh. The abdominals and adductor longus form part of the myofascial front functional line as reported by Thomas Myers. Let's take a closer look at the adductor abdominal connection. You can see in the image here a nice clear representation of the adductor abdominal connection or to be precise the adductor longus and rectus abdominis connection. The anterior surface of the adductor tendon is flat and tendinous but on the posterior surface, the muscle fibers continue much closer to the bony attachment than on the anterior surface. And like many tendons, the area between the muscle and bone has a lesser blood supply than the osseous attachment or the musculotendinous junction. The first description of adductor tendinopathy was from the early 1990s. But of course, the adductor longus is only one of many adductor muscles and you can see on the screen here just how many muscles contribute to this adductor group. You would naturally be covering these muscles with passive treatments such as massage and stimulating them with strengthening when we do our rehabilitation exercises. It's not possible to isolate the adductor longus so you'll end up strengthening the whole adductor group with your general hip adduction strengthening techniques. So the common causes of adductor tendinopathy are running and in particular direction changes that you'll find with agility training and also the kicking action in football and American football and rugby for example. This condition is also common in sports that involve other rapid direction changes which includes many competitive team sports. The other pathologies that could occur in this region include pubic bone stress and stress fractures, apophysitis pubis and adductor enthesopathies, otherwise known as insertional tendinopathies. Adductor strains and abdominal tendinopathies can also occur. So complex pathology can occur in this region and it can be difficult to diagnose. Of note though is the fact that bone stress response is considered a normal finding in athletic populations. But the bone stress has an upper limit and going above this would produce symptoms and then structurally progress to a stress fracture which would of course not be considered a normal finding. The presentation of this pubic bone stress response would be very similar to that of adductor tendinopathy. Pubic apophysitis is more common in young athletes age range 16 to 21. As a diagnosis, this can be significantly aided by an MRI scan. If this is available, or if not, you'll have to begin with a treatment and management plan and carefully monitor their response. This graph here shows the muscle activation and stretch occurring in the adductor longus muscle during maximum effort soccer kicking. You can see on the top left that the peak adductor force occurs in the first half of the swing phase and then in the second half of the swing phase before ball contact, the adductor is seen to reach its maximal length. This brings us to the end of the adductor tendinopathy anatomy lecture. Now it's time to move on to the next lecture. Welcome to the adductor tendinopathy assessment lecture. Firstly, let's have a look at some of the other pathologies that could present as being very similar to an adductor tendinopathy. They're shown on the screen here and you may wish to pause the screen later so you can have a look at this differential diagnosis. But effectively a tendinopathy, we're looking for unilateral upper adductor pain, 
rapid onset that may likely be linked to loading and the symptoms like many tendinopathies will often improve after a warm-up but may then of course worsen with rest. The condition can be aggravated by acceleration, kicking and side-to-side -side cutting agility type training and due to the connection between the abdominals and adductor longus then sit-ups can also be provocative as well. Coughing and sneezing would also put pressure on this region and may provoke some symptoms. It's likely that the area would be tender on palpation, I'm talking of course about the upper adductor longus tendon, and that there may be some pain with the squeeze test as well, which we'll look at in a moment, and the MRI scan may be very helpful at identifying the pathology. As you can see, the other causes of pain from this region can be a bone stress response, more of an acute adductor strain as opposed to a tendinopathy or an enthesopathy where the issue is more focused on the actual osseous attachment and an apophysitis of this region may also be the cause of the pain. Subjectively, we're looking for the following things. Is there a history of previous groin injury? Are there high levels of play and training? And is there reduced hip adductor strength relative to the abductors? And we'll have a look at some ways of testing that in just a moment. Also, has the athlete undergone low levels or perhaps no preparatory training for the sports that they are participating in? Let's have a look now at the objective testing. I usually like to start by doing some simple active testing of the lumbar spine, as shown in the screen here, simply testing flexion, extension and side flexion movements. From a supine position, I can then assess spinal rotation before turning the patient over to palpate around the back of the pelvis and lumbar spine. Assessment of the pelvis and the sacroiliac joint as shown here, performing the stalk test. And then the Lazlet's cluster for SIJ provocation testing. Followed by moving on to hip assessment, internal, external rotation, the Faber's test, and then bringing the hip into its inner quadrant for the Fadir's test. I then move on to specific adductor testing with the squeeze test shown here with a long lever. I then use biofeedback to get some numerical value for this short lever squeeze test. I've placed the hips here in about 45 degrees as this position is one which particularly loads up the adductor longus muscle. I then stabilize the other leg and perform a stretch test for the adductor muscles. And then a resistance test for the adductor abdominal connection. As shown here, I can apply some extra resistance to see if this provokes the patient's pain. So this concludes my typical objective assessment. I may also spend more time clarifying the exact location of the pain and do some palpation around the region or have the patient to palpate around the region in order to identify the particular structures which are generating the pain. And as you can see on the screen here, I've put up again the differential diagnosis table, which can be helpful for identifying the pain locations and just what they might mean in terms of the likely pathologies. Okay, now it's time to move on to the treatment section for adductor tendinopathy. Welcome to the adductor tendinopathy treatment and rehabilitation lecture. Let's get started. So patients may find it beneficial to use taping or a sacroiliac joint support belt around their pelvis as this is something which may reduce symptoms. So 
quite simply something you may wish to try. There are taping options again for the adductors and in the taping lecture we also looked at some compression wrapping around the upper thigh which can be beneficial for reducing adductor symptoms. Massage of the adductor muscles can also be a beneficial treatment for reducing the symptoms of adductor tendinopathy. As with the other lower limb tendinopathies, load management is a key thing which we need to consider to bring about a successful treatment and rehabilitation outcome. We would need to reduce non-linear running, that is direction changes and zigzag type activities in order to allow enough space and capacity to benefit from the strength and conditioning which will then bring about some positive changes and hopefully lead to a reduction in symptoms and a return to sport. I'm now going to take you through a selection of progressive rehabilitation exercises, beginning with this isometric adductor exercise, which can be performed at different hip flexion angles as shown here. We can then get more dynamic and bring in a resistance band so we can target one side and also work on pelvic stability at the same time. Here's a similar exercise using the band placed around the ankle to allow a long lever version of the previous exercise. To further challenge stability and control, this exercise can be performed in the standing position as shown here. Once you've got the rehabilitation underway, it's important to monitor the initial response to these loading exercises and to remember that tendons often have a delayed response. So it's not until the next day that you can really gauge the outcome from the previous day's exercises. Here are a couple of progressions for adductor isolation exercises. This adductor side plank is particularly challenging. I'm a fan of the slide discs for adductor exercises. You just need to be careful when performing these that you don't stretch a little bit too far and end up causing yourself another injury. Importantly here, I'm using the stick placed centrally to take some of my body weight so I can control the lowering and make sure I don't get stuck in the splits position. From here, we can progress to general hip stability exercises such as the one leg deadlift as shown here for example and the side squats or side lunges can be particularly effective at strengthening up the hip musculature including the adductors and it also gives a nice adductor stretch to that opposing non-weight bearing leg. As we get more advanced with our stability exercises we can move on to dynamic movements which challenge our core stability as shown here. So as you can see, the progression of adductor rehabilitation involves so much more than just adductor isolation exercises. Because we're often dealing with performance athletes, the rehabilitation requires a much more global and advanced approach involving multiple body movements and motor control training. It's also recommended that trunk mobility exercises should form part of an adductor rehabilitation program. So here's a selection of trunk mobility exercises which you could use with your patients.
as mentioned previously, we're going to need to make some changes to the patient's loading whilst we get the rehabilitation underway. So we can simply switch from the typical training involving direction changes and zigzags, for example, to non-impact training, such as on an elliptical trainer as shown here, or then progressing to treadmill training where the surface is soft and the movement is much more linear than the direction changes required with a typical football or rugby training, for example. However, at some point, we're going to need to get back to the agility training. And as you can see in a couple of videos here, there are many advanced agility techniques which you can incorporate into the rehabilitation program at the correct time. That, of course, being the later stages of their rehabilitation once their symptoms have settled. But you would want to do this with an individual on a one-to-one -one basis and assess their tolerance to this type of training before you put them back into a group situation where they're much more likely to push themselves in order to keep up with their peers. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this lecture. In summary, just a few things to remember to help organise the information that was given during this presentation. Firstly, reduce the running, specifically agility type training. Then identify any adjuncts that reduce and manage symptoms, such as massage, taping or the sacroiliac joint belt, for example. Start your rehabilitation with isolation exercises, perhaps isometric or slow controlled motions. Gauge and monitor the early response to this loading and then from here we can progress. And we can progress based on loading response and symptoms. It's important as we progress to incorporate mobility and strength training for the core and for the whole body and to move away from just focusing on the adductor muscle group. Next, carefully reinstate agility training before returning to group training.